Uh, okay, uh, I guess we'll uh, get started. Yeah, and people might be filtering in, that's cool. Uh, so thank you for coming uh, to this session um, on uh, low-tech uh, high returns. I thought I'd better get in before the door shut. <laughs> um, my name is Carl Deal, um, and I'll, I'll be presenting first, and then uh, Lucas... Lucas Longacre, I'll be presenting second. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, um, so yeah, I, um, my talk is, uh, is called uh, Apparitions for that, uh, Low-Tech High Returns by Ghosting the Routine. And um, the sort of play here is, uh, you, you've heard of this phrase, right? That there's an app for that. Um, there's a ready-made solution. There's sort of a convenient um, uh, a sort of software or, or sort of procedure or the, the best and the greatest and the latest and that this is, is the, the sort of a way to go. And I would say, well, yes. And also there, there are apparitions for that. There are ghosts. Every tool and technology uh, is haunted by possible, potential, plausible, and sometimes uh, preferable uses um, that can be sort of summoned up in a particular context and then sort of synthesized uh, into a uh, solution. And um, then there's the idea of, of ghosting, which is the contemporary use, right, is that this is sort of this sheepish move where you, you sort of suddenly um, stop communicating with someone you're in a relationship with. Um, there's like no, no more communication. But then it also has this older term uh, in a media context of uh, a ghosting uh, that happens on a, on a screen, right, where there's like some sort of interference. It's like a bad transmission or some sort of electronic glitch. Um, at any rate, in, so in this presentation, um, we'll be um, thinking about ghosting the routines, so at least temporarily sort of suspending uh, communication with these kind of go-to responses or, or sort of like the, this particular sort of app. Um, and also um, thinking about uh, um, ways of thinking differently about sort of resources that may be available and also ways of thinking about interference um, as something of a, a potentially of a, a sort of creative catalyst um, for problem solving. Um, so these ghosts, um, you, you, you sometimes like run into these sort of like grotesque ghosts mm -hmm. um, like this um, because you don't have sort of time or resources and then this you arrive at this kind of ingenious solution and or creative practical joke that's a response to the sort of dire straits at hand. Um, in this case, a uh, makeshift uh, kind of projection mount uh, without uh, the, the sort of proper... Was this, is this your photo? It, it may be my photo. I don't know if I'm <laughs> hesitant to, to claim this. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, the show's starting in about half an hour and... Um, we're backstage. We've got some duct tape and some debris at this nightclub. So, all right, well, let's we'll make something work. It's not pretty, but it does the job like for the time being. Um, it's really not sort of like about the particular tools or, or sort of resources, but how you kind of bring them together. So there's some assessment of the situation, th what's available, and um, then sort of like synthesizing uh, a kind of like provisional metaphor or analogy that, that will sort of work. Um, uh, at, at hand. Um, and uh, so uh, for me, like, m I, I first uh, started uh, sort of seeing these ghosts, these sort of like potential uh, alternative uses um, when I was um, growing up in Syracuse, New York. And um, like uh, so many people that uh, make use of uh, open signal, uh, I had my own uh, public access show uh, when I was a teenager. And um, so one day I was working with uh, this, this machine, which is supposed to make titles, um, but I couldn't get it to make the titles. So I sort of like kind of started poking around at this and, um, and I managed, I'm like not sure what I did, uh, but it, this, there was this kind of this amazing kind of glitched, like saturated image that came out of this. And um, I knew it was wrong and I didn't have my title, but I was just like, as, as sort of like a 16 year old kid in the 90s, um, like, you know, before the resources of, of today, just like blown away that I could create this kind of like effect. And um, 
so um, I tried to kind of like create a map where I like noted all the buttons I had pressed, and so I could kind of articulate the process. How did I get here, and how can I get here again? Because uh, you know, at the time, I was making like no budget science fiction movies. With my friends, you're like a kind of crappy like astronaut costume, and you're like wandering around behind the high school, like. You're, you're asking a lot on the sort of suspension of disbelief, but if you could recolorize this and kind of bring in some of these saturated unnatural colors, it would be more sort of compelling as like an alien planet. Um, so I was eager to sort of get back to this state and, and sort of work with it and, and sort of fine tune it and develop a sort of expressive range. Um, and um, I did sort of uh, arrive at some sort of idiosyncratic sort of palette that I could usually get to work when I would go in there. Um, this uh, sort of process is something that this contemporary artist, Rosa Menkman, uh, refers to as um, the exoskeleton of progress. Um, and, it, and the basic sort of idea is that, um, that, that these sort of glitches occur. And um, uh, you, I mean, your initial response is like, oh, great. And like, back to the drawing board. Or you just like pause and like consider this. And that if you sort of stay with it and work with it, there may be some value that's a bit hidden or a bit sort of protected from view. Um, but if you stay with it, um, you may be able to sort of like extract this sort of value um, and, and sort of use this in a way outside of its intended purpose, um, but nonetheless like find these other uses that are sort of permitted um, by uh, whatever this sort of technology is uh, at hand. Um, now, um, <laughs> I wanted you all to sort of like uh, have an opportunity, a hands-on opportunity to sort of uh, try out this, uh, this sort of process. So I have this little exercise, which is not necessarily about audiovisual production, but will be this opportunity to ghost the routine. Um, and I'll ask you, to the extent possible, in the way you're sort of seated, to be at work in little groups. And uh, I'm going to give you an object, and you may be familiar with this object with its intended use, I mean, maybe not. But what you want to do is sort of temporarily suspend that recognition of what this is for, and just think about what, what else you could do with this thing. Um, and so it would be imaginative. We'll just take a few minutes. That you could devise one or two ideas. Um, Should we show an example, though, so they can see? Or is it more like cold, cold turkey? Yeah, I mean, you just want to right. sort of take this thing for instance, someone will get to you work with this. Who knows what this thing is? But it does this, and it looks um, like a potato smasher. But yeah, um, so I talked about this. But I <laughs> suspend your recognition, sure. um, so as to not prevent the sort of alternative uses that are afforded by the way this thing maneuvers. Um, so um, I think I have objects enough for like I can help hand them up too. four groups but so if this, you just kind of cluster uh, around you want this or you maybe you're just in your object, row however back. so just yeah come up with uh, a few We're ideas a here like so if you want to you don't mind grabbing Oop. this and maybe passing it back um, anybody else need need something I think the we can object back more. there. I think you can have a few more back there. Sure. You're supposed to be. Uh, What's that? You're supposed to be my, my straight man. Oh, I thought I was trying to be. Oh, okay. Do you have more? Um. How many more do you have? That's, those are the best ones. The other ones were like trying to find some random other stuff. These ones are like advanced user. <laughs> I think you have the right attitude. <laughs> Maybe we can uh, kind of like reframe and um, just if uh, you could all share just um, one of the things, uh, one or two of the, the things that, that sort of came to mind as a uh, sort of alternative use for this object. 
Um, and we just, just can kind of share just, yeah. yeah. We came up with a stamp, um, a massager, a launch toy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And a uh, futuristic microphone. Oh, yeah. Mm. Excellent. Thanks. Um, the mountain, or whatever, is that what, whatever that is. What is it? <laughs> well, um, we thought of it as a hat. Yeah. <laughs> Either direction. It, it has more room this way. Um, it looks kind of like a mask. Yeah. Um, what else did we think? Oh, headrest. It, it sits on here really nicely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A puppet. I thought it might work as a puppet somehow. And there's little holes on the top that could be, like, for a dried arrangement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You could wear it, like, on your head when you can't see Mount Hood so, and to assist with photos so people, like, frame. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Or perhaps a cereal bowl. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's could and then should. Yeah. But, all right. All right. Um, okay. Pasta strainer. Yeah. Oh, nice. It's a, a Selective. It's like a camping <laughs> pasta strainer. Yeah. It's a cookie. You could project a flower-like pattern on. Oh the yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> or you could uh, use it as a strainer to scoop small fish out of a pond. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> So the so what it is is a bicycle helmet that you can use as a cookie, right? And then also you can put water, pasta with water in there, and it'll drain the water out because mm -hmm. there's holes in the top. And then what was the last one? Uh, basket. Oh, a, a basket which you could hold many, uh, like to the farmers market or something, right. right? We take this everywhere we go. We use it a lot. I see right. that. Yeah. It'll, you know, or you can just like be on your bike and you go, and then you make dinner and all this, and then you have a show. Right. Multi-purpose, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Very cool. Um, that we thing. This is a multi-use tool. We could use it for broadcast production with uh, microphones, with either boom or parabolic mm. mic. You could to diffuse light, but we could also use it to dry beef jerky. Um, <laughs> we just put the pieces of jerky on this, and then we run a fan over it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this is a really great way to dehydrate your meat. Oh yeah. So the umbrella could be used for dehydrating jerky, and then what was the first one for? Oh, and we can also use it for broadcasting. For broadcasting you know, production. Put a microphone to it. We could use it uh, as a parabolic mic. So as a parabolic uh, mic, yeah, or or like an uh, or like for satellite yeah. projection. Okay. But really, we mostly use it for jerky. Mostly for jerky. Mostly for jerky. <laughs> We're in Portland, Oregon. I'm not surprised. Uh, nice. Do right? They're also right. There's the hook. The hook on it, so you could hang it at a party and put the chips in there. Yeah. So then like, there's more table space. Yeah. yeah. As a salsa add-on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We'll bring the pasta. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, OK, there was another object back there. Oh, the final object. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have that idea. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, reflex hammer. That's right. Mm. Test mm -hmm. reflexes. <laughs> All right. Um, if you go camping, um, it could be a stake to hold your tent down. If you have several of these. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It also, um, if you need something for self defense, you know, you have it in your bun, you just whip it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wow, if you're so desperate for purple, maybe you can melt this down. Oof. Does it die? It's probably not, probably not a good idea. But. That's an incredible variety, though. <laughs> yeah. Just to do a quick recap, because the audience listening, we, we're the only ones mic'd, unfortunately. So, but let's do a recap, because that's a lot. So it was for hair, for putting in your hair, right? Uh, it was for chopsticks to eat out of the pasta at the party with the nachos. Uh, what was the, uh, the another one? It was... Oh, self-defense, or for a doctor for testing your reflexes. Uh, you can melt it down if you really wanted purple wax or something, right? Right. You um, use it as a stake for 
Oh. Oh yeah, for a tent for steak. I like that being in Oregon and you know, everybody's like outdoors is always prominently yeah, featured, right. so we could use this to stake down a tent. Yeah. Cool. It could also be like a scarecrow, low budget scarecrow. <laughs> dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are scary. Um Okay, uh, so excellent. Um, I will uh, have to re recollect these. They do have <laughs> intended functions in my household. I'm just curious to know what you use them for now after this <laughs> yeah, right. exercise. Um, <coughs> okay, but so yeah, so I mean, that's sort of part of the process. Like, okay, what does this do? What does it afford? How, how can this kind of connect to sort of like other ideas? Um, this uh, artist engineer, uh, Hank Rudolph, sort of reminds us that aesthetic assumptions are built into every piece of hardware and software we use to make art. Often tools are packaged to presuppo presuppose certain applications, perhaps even designed as metaphors or emulations of other existing uh, systems. And I write this, of course, the way computers work, um, uh, in particular with computers, um, where you, you have all the icons and trappings of a uh, film post-production environment and the timeline editing or, or with photography or painting or animation. Um, and these are, of course, useful for navigating and moving between spaces and drawing on uh, previous uh, understanding. Um, but they are also, they're, they're sort of inform a particular use um, and they are sort of metaphors. So you can also um, uh, sort of uh, take heed of the, the sort of ghosts that are hovering nearby, the, all these kind of possible uh, potential possible and preferable uses um, of software or other tools um, that uh, may um, uh, uh, permit you to uh, uh, do more or do differently uh, with these uh, tools. Um, and um, the uh, approach that I would sort of recommend, which is sort of the premise in this kind of exercise is we just kind of uh, uh, approach it, any uh, sort of tool as this kind of like open-ended architecture, this kind of like modular uh, thing um, that um, will have a certain sort of range of possibility and then you can um, uh, annex that to existing knowledge of, of tools that, that, uh, that uh, are perhaps the uh, expected or, or sort of uh, in intended tools to use. And so I wanted to just uh, have a, f a few sort of examples of just some of these sort of provisional metaphors and ways of um, working with other sort of existing materials or sort of non-obvious um, audiovisual production uh, considerations. Um, okay, right, so the obvious one is like the Dali on demand and there's some sort of like rhyme or off kilter rhyme. You're like, okay, well you have this cart and has wheels and you have the Dali and so, okay, this, this works, right? Um, uh, this uh, artist, um, Valley Export, Austrian artist, did this sort of performance called Adjunct Dislocations. Um, and you know, she has like these Super 8 cameras and she sh has them attached on, uh, in the front and on the back. And she's shooting and she's sort of exploring different ways of representation. Um, you could also, I mean, could you use this if you were in a pinch and you didn't have like all of your crew and you're like, all right, well, I'm going to shoot my subject at the same time as shooting B-roll and sort of cutaway shots as you kind of like maneuver around, you know, in a pinch, right? Um, uh, chroma keying the sky to sort of like add in your content. It's all the best of like how you frame um, if you could shoot like really high up on a hill, you didn't have your green screen set up, right? Then on these last few days, now, now we're back to other challenges <laughs> of Portland weather. Um, and um, this is an idea from uh, this filmmaker, uh, George Kuchar. Um, he and his brother um, just like made all these films from the 1960s sort of onward. These like no budget, kind of campy uh, productions. Um, but they're always sort of like ingenious use of uh, um, available, available sort of resources. And uh, one of the other uh, sort of ideas that they had was um, it, instead of having your actors like memorize their lines, you, you just record the dialogue beforehand and then you play it live on the set. And so the, the actors just have to sort of lip sync and then they can focus more on being expressive. Um, and then this is also a way of like getting the timing you want. So um, 
you know, these are uh, time saving, uh, time saving techniques. Um, okay, uh, alternative approaches to sound design. Um, if you're shooting in like a cavernous uh, space where it may be a parking garage and there's a lot of reverberation, so if you're gonna add sound later, you're gonna be like spending all this time with like, oh, well, what's the right filter and what's the right sort of settings on this thing to match this kind of reverberation? So um, you could alternately um, sort of do that live um, and play the sound effects on a phone in the space while you're shooting. Um, Right, kind of bring this back to the live performance, but then these sounds will also be sort of treated by the architectural filters or the ar architectural acoustics of the space. Um, and you could have like multiple, I mean, if you want to get into sort of multi-tracking, um, you could have multiple operators. Another kind of variation on that is using um, uh, something like Freesound, which maybe people use this, I mean, it's a great resource uh, for sounds, Creative Commons based licensing, but you can also like on your laptop itself, um, because all these sounds, you can, you can preview them and you can loop them. So then you can use your browser with multiple tabs as like a multi-track and just start a loop, get another one, start a loop. Um, it leaves something to say for mixing, but uh, nonetheless, if you did need to sort of like build some sort of composite um, space, you don't have the proper sound equipment you could use your uh, laptop in this way. This is one of the sort of affordances of um, the laptop and the sort of browser pad, this sort of portability, right? Um, okay. Now this one's <laughs> interesting. Um, this filmmaker, Manu Lush, um, London-based, um, has sort of this theory like, well, you don't actually need any cameras to shoot your film because there's cameras all over the city. There's like surveillance cameras all over. So just stage your movie in front of the cameras and then acquire the tapes by legal means. And um, uh, that's what she did when she made this faceless, which is this like kind of excellent collapse of like fact and fiction. It's, a, it's kind of like a near future dystopic sci-fi in which everybody in the society is most everybody is faceless. Their faces are blurred out because of sort of this rampant, pervasive uh, 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 invasions of privacy that have sort of continued. Um, and, but then there's, there's sort of like the protagonists are sort of like some sort of resistance and kind of breaking through. Um, and uh, the way she did this was just like stage it in front of these cameras and then like uh, getting the tapes, the CC. CCTV operators, like they had to digitally remove everybody's face. <laughs> Only the person who, who re requested it gets it. So this is kind of this kind of genius really like outsourcing the, your, your, uh, <laughs> your digital effects to yeah, the government. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. Um, and I'm just actually remember there is a CCTV filmmakers manifesto you can look up that's kind of related to this project. Um, okay. All right. So then um, the final sort of section here is um, uh, so <laughs> these ghosts. These are generally sort of friendly ghosts. You want to keep them around. You want to sort of like nourish them and, and, and sort of keep them at hand. You, you don't want to call the exorcist, but you do want to exercise them, right? You want to practice using these ghosts, um, using these potential and possible uses so that you remain agile. And when you are faced with a scenario, um, where you need to problem solve, you can both sort of draw on previous experiences of synthesizing solutions, and you are better adept at like ass assessing what um, uh, what you might do sort of in that situation. Um, and another approach to this is to um, uh, sort of design your own constraints, um, uh, a sort of constraints for sort of creativity sort of approach. And um, I just talk about this a little bit in relation to this place called Signal Culture that's in uh, Owego, New York, upstate New York. And um, it's this center that has all kinds of um, video and audio synthesis tools, image processing tools, also playback decks, and a number of like strange, uh, very eclectic, often artist kind of customized um, hardware. And um, uh, I did a residency here with a sound artist from Brooklyn named Nat Hawks, and um, we had proposed to make um, uh, audiovisual portraits of the 
village of Owego, thinking about the past, present, and future. And um, this space is very much an open-ended architecture, and it's set up so you can sort of connect anything to anything else, um, which in itself can be daunting. So we came up with constraints to sort of shape how we would sort of make use of this um, in the time we were there. Um, oops, let's do things. So um, we did, I mean, in this context, we had ideas about landscape and we had certain sort of ideas about different temporalities, past, present, and future. Um, but we came up with little prompts for ourselves, uh, say on location, perspective, temporality, palette, and season, and then sort of shuffled them. And then each night we would sort of draw out this constellation and talk about it a little like, okay, this is gonna be in prehistoric Owego from the perspective of humidity. What does that mean? Um, but it's like, well, I don't know what it means, but this is a prompt to sort of think differently about how we might sort of shoot stuff uh, sort of around town. Um, and um, then in the morning we go get breakfast and then we go out and um, Nat was recording sounds with these sort of prompts in mind. I was recording video with these uh, prompts in mind. Uh, and then we would go back to the studio and try to kind of work with these tools, which offer their own constraints. They're just like, it's kind of this totally bonkers, sort of like mad science environment. Um, I don't know if you can see that sort of stuff going on. It looks like a normal kind of like switching board <laughs> the closer you get. It's just like totally weird, like things routing together and stuff. Um, anyway, um, so um, we um, devise these constraints for this context. But you could just as easily like do something like assess the last five projects you've done and think about it in terms of tasks, uh, in terms of media used, in terms of goals, and like, oh, wow, well, I'm always using a handheld camera. I'm going to suspend the use of that and work through other means, or um, I only use close-ups, or I'm working with this script and it, and it calls for like 10 people, 10 actors, but I only, only use one actor and rely on ingenious composition to create the virtual geography uh, and, and make this work. Obviously like costumes maybe are in the mix as well. Um, but at any rate, um, this doesn't guarantee that like you, you sort of like come to this kind of breakthrough, but it does, become like a catalyst for it where you really have to like push yourself to sort of think beyond the, the sort of safety handles or the sort of go-to responses um, and uh, yeah so um, uh, skip that one but um, I just wanted to return to uh, this my, my sort of like initiation into this sort of stuff in uh, this sort of cable access station in Syracuse because there is this sort of curious factoid which is that um, uh, the city of Syracuse and the sort of cable systems company um, uh, sort of sealed the deal on like bringing cable TV to Syracuse and with it uh, public access facilities uh, 40 years ago today on April 27th uh, 1978 and um, this date uh, has sort of like stuck with me in part because there was this newspaper clipping in the video editing suite that I always was going to and I was making this show um, but also because April 27th, 1978 is the day that I was born. And so there's this kind of curious cosmic <laughs> convergence. And I, I, when I was asked to do this thing, I was just like, all right, well, this is, this is the closer. Um, and, but, but actually, the closer, I'll leave you with this quote. Um, Capture accidents. The wrong answer uh, is the right answer in search of a different question. Collect wrong answers as part of the process ask different questions uh, from Bruce Mao, uh, sort of designer. Also, this incomplete manifesto for growth is like really uh, some great, great uh, prompts in and of itself. So uh, thank you. Yeah, I almost dropped the, uh, I spilled the beans almost that it was your birthday at the top. I had this um, big, like, the wait for I did, it. Now I see why. It's the yeah. conclusion to the whole piece. All right. Anyway. I had one chance to do this. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, full screen is not that. OK. Um, my name is Lucas Longacre. This is my company, uh, Ironway, which has existed since uh, New York City, where I lived there for, uh, how do you make this play? 
for over 11 years. I had a company right when the internet started becoming, you know, video on the internet started becoming a thing. Uh, that's what I specialized in because I saw the writing on the wall. I was getting very sick of working in television. Um, you know, reality TV was really taking over, uh, and so the the rates were dropping. And you know, working as a professional in the industry, you know, I didn't feel very fulfilled with my job. Uh, so what I did is I started teaming up with my wife. Uh, at the time, who was working for an environmental uh, nonprofit in New York City, and we started doing uh, small, like uh, one to three minute videos for the web. This is before uh, YouTube existed, just to put some context. Uh, we had some really big successes putting stuff on like the front page of MySpace and getting like millions of views in a, in a week. And up to that point, most of the content I'd created uh, was for, you know, a short film where 50 people in the audience would see it. So I've always thankfully been in you know the situation to you know be embracing new technology but also having to comprehend what that would do to my career because as a working professional as the gear technology changes it completely disrupts everything that you set your career path with which can be you know very uh, you know rewarding but it also can be soul crushing oh whoops wrong one so I'm just going to show you quickly the reel that my current reel that I had just cut this year uh, in December for this year, which, as you, those of you know, that's always something difficult. So there's me, and that's my uh, email if you want to get in touch with me uh, after the fact. I can't tell you if I have it at the end of the presentation, but I can individually give it to you as well. my first exposure to the fact that there weren't many of us. That had to change. We're going to make this thing so fun, people won't want to leave ever. Each generation steps a few bold individuals. America, the world's greatest country and the world's most utterly ridiculous country. Anyway, problem solved. You're welcome. This revolution is not dehumanizing. It's about liberating us. I have a shot from Wallia, so we're starting to build up this world. Everything about it is all based on imagination because you know, we're creating something from nothing. Okay, so... In, the, in throughout that reel, there's a compilation of stuff I've worked on for years. Uh, some of those were done with a crew of 20 plus, and some of that was done with just me as the entire crew. Could you tell which one was which? No, right? That's what technology will get you, especially as you work as a professional in this industry. You start realizing that, like, uh, you know, you, there's so much that you can do as a solo, you know, as a one-man band or one-woman band. That, uh, and that's going to be the kind of the um, what my discussion is going to focus around is that is that like as the technology is getting more affordable and cheaper, uh, it actually Im can empower you to be like much more of an incredible storyteller. And uh, and it's so the leveling of the playing field, you're going to eventually just have to rely on you know your storytelling abilities and not just the technical gear. 
And that's something that I think should be very encouraging to anybody, professional, amateur. And for me, it was terrifying. Because when I first was in New York City, I wanted to be a writer, producer, director. So I, as fast as I could, tried to work my way up the ladder from PA all the way to a producer. And I had a company, and I had employees. And then the financial crash happened in 2009. And all of a sudden, I was like, it was just me and my wife. We were going to move to the West Coast. We had to lay all of our employees off. Uh, but on the way, because my wife was really into food and travel uh, and sustainability, we started uh, doing uh, little episodes of like web, web series episodes of the show Original Fair that is now on PBS. Its fifth season is going to be launching uh, this year. And, uh, but the challenge went from being used to producing content with like a crew of at least four or five for documentary style. You have the camera operator, you have the you know sound operator, you have a, a, a production assistant, maybe even two cameras because you have the second camera. And so I had to take all of that uh, workflow that I was really used to and try to figure out how to do that with just one person. So here's uh, us in the field for the show. Here's my wife. And check out the show, by the way, the original fair. If you have the PBS app or Apple TV Roku, you can see it. Um, so here's me on, on the left side. That is my camera rig. And if you notice, uh, it, what's on there, uh, I have a, a uh, you know, my main camera, which is the Blackmagic Cinema camera. Uh, and attached to that, on top, is a shotgun microphone, right? And that runs down to this little uh, 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 sound recorder on my hip. Um, that is has so that shotgun mic is a pretty decent shotgun mic going into it for for sound But then there's also wi two wireless mics on the bottom of that So one is on the subject or sorry one is on the host my wife Kelly and the other is on the subject So if we have multiple people I can get all that audio I don't have the lens on now But typically what I'll film with is a wide-angle lens and there's a reason for that And it's because if I want to get good audio and the person's not mic'd I can get as close as possible to them and still frame them as I would a typical um, what's it called, like a typical headshot, and then the mic's right in their face. So it was like, I needed to solve a problem of audio for multiple subjects or documentary, as well as be able to, um, uh, you know, and uh, as those of you who work in documentary, like, audio is 80% of your product, because you're going to shape the whole narrative through that. Uh, so I was able to get a really good soundscape and audioscape from just what I had on my person. Mm. Then what I'd had to do, though, was figure out how to get enough coverage to shoot a scene that would make you know that would look like I had multiple cameras, uh, and that's because of how affordable this technology was. Oh, and by the way, see on my on my right hip, I have a still photo camera. That's a Canon. That's um, the same EF mount for my main camera. So what I'm able to do is, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I kind of learned this from watching a um, a documentary on a war photographer who would have multiple cameras. But the idea is. In the moment, if I need to switch lenses very quickly to go from a wide to a tight, uh, I seriously can just pop it off and switch them really quick. But also, I have a, a camera on my hip for taking publicity photos and stills, which is extremely useful. So if you think about this, I'm a one-man band in the field that can capture all this stuff very efficiently. Uh, but I also I edit. So I have to edit my own material because I'm the only crew. So by me being on set, making hard decisions for the narrative, I'm able to, to piece it all together while shooting and, and listen, being like, OK, I got that sound bite. I got that part of the story. So I'm story producing while shooting, while making sure audio is working properly. And it's not an easy job. But I'll say that, that you can, as a one-man band, one-woman band, you can uh, make something that is high quality, television quality, with just one person. And that is revolutionary. And that is, that is not going to change in this industry. That is only going to intensify as uh, technology gets cheaper and more affordable. So the one thing, if you get one takeaway from my part of this uh, discussion today, it's uh, you can do it all by yourself if you need to. And the idea of necessity that uh, Carl was talking about, about restrictions, you know, I had the restriction. It's, I love that you said what, Carl? You said, uh, instead of 10 actors, you have one actor. Well, I had to realize this with a crew. I said, instead of having four or five people, we had no budget. We were doing it from scratch. I, so I, I found a, a workflow that worked for me that could get the same quality you know, it took a lot more actual work, but same quality with, with, with those restrictions. And it made me a much better storyteller and filmmaker by just having to go through that process. Um, so what I'm going to do, you know, just for the next few minutes is talk about some of the things that are available to you as filmmakers that I highly recommend you check out. Um, one of the things, before I quickly segue into that, is I, I remember when GoPros first hit the market. And as a, you know, a professional videographer, 
it enraged me at first because I was seeing all this beautiful footage and I was like, these people don't know photography. They just you know, put a camera on their helmet and they're in these beautiful locations. And then that's like, of course it's gonna look amazing. So it was kind of scary because I was like, you know, is this gonna put me out of a job? Then I, I, you know, I was doing an episode uh, in Hawaii where we had to do, go uh, spear fishing and foraging in the ocean. And I could not take my gear into the ocean like that. So instead I brought the GoPro with me and I was swimming around snorkeling for two hours. And all I had was a GoPro to capture a whole scene with uh, three different people in the ocean. And I can tell you I was able to do it because I approached the GoPro like it was any other camera, a restriction. It's just a wide angle lens. So what do I have to do? I have to go really close for the close ups. Mm. I have to get the wide shot. I have to get all my coverage and I have to piece together the story. And you can do that with a fixed lens. Like that's all you need. And the idea that I could, as one person, go in and bring gear into the water and get that shot, like that was actually a really, uh, a, like a, a, an awakening moment for me where it's like, instead of being fearful of this technology about like, oh my God, how is this gonna destabilize what I'm doing? You just gotta figure out where the opportunities are. So one of the things I do constantly, see this um, camera on the little, so that little tripod there, those little gorilla tripods, are so useful. So I always in the field, I'll have at least one of those. And it's whether it's um, to stable as a stabilizer for my camera while I'm holding it. I also will put it you know, a second camera on the table, whether it's a GoPro or my other Canon uh, that's on my hip. There's my second camera if I ever have an interview or I need to get you know talk to two people. Um, so I have this like four channel recorder, this Tascam that I love, but there are so many affordable audio recorders on the market. And the reason I'm gonna emphasize that is what I said about, um, audio being 80% of your, uh, you know, your content for documentary, uh, get it, they're so affordable and it's like, you could seriously shoot everything on your iPhone, on your mobile phone, on whatever phone video uh, capturing uh, you know, device you have. Uh, as long as there's really good audio, it'll make you, you, that's the difference between amateur and professional most of the time. Cause uh, let me just, like, I see you have a phone here. What, what iPhone number is that? It's the SE. So does that do 4K? I'm not sure. So mine doesn't. I have like an old one because I have so many. But anyway, the uh, but some of these phones nowadays they shoot literally higher quality than most of the that your television will even play yet. And like I can't describe to you how like that is a huge benefit, and you already have it in your pocket. It's going to get you a great image uh, quality. And then they, if you look at this on the bottom right, we have like all these new lens attachments you can get. I'm not kidding you. 150 bucks. If you like use the same. Um, uh, you know, rules of filmmaking for, you know, having a stable camera, framing, lighting. If you apply all that stuff to what is already existing on the market, uh, like I love these little gimbals you can attach to your phone. I actually have a little uh, tripod attachment for my phone. So if I'm on set and I just want to get an extra camera, I have the phone there. Um, and if you record really good audio separately, you sync them up in post, which is programs do that automatically now. You just press a button and it syncs them. Uh, like that is television quality image television quality uh, sound, and you just have that all in your pocket. You're walking around with that every day. Um, and if you notice these little mic attachments, like a lavalier mic that'll plug into your cell phone, like that stuff is all very affordable. And, and as a working video professional, I would use this stuff all the time. Like, in fact, I encourage, I have a lot of students who are, they always want to know, oh, because I teach at the Art Institute of Portland, but my students always want to know like, oh, what's this great camera? I want to learn all this great camera stuff. And I'm like, can you just start, like you have a phone in your pocket that records video, start there. Like just start learning the basics of, of like framing and composition. And then, you know, we'll get you up to speed as to how to make sure that, you know, you understand the technical aspect. Uh, but having these little gimbals, these tripods, uh, it's all very uh, accessible and very affordable. Um, and I, you know, I highly recommend, you know, getting comfortable using this stuff. Because as I said, the industry is only heading there further and further. Uh, I recently took a pickup job for a journalism startup company where they were shooting everything entirely on mobile. And the reason I worked with them, the money was terrible, but it was because I was fascinated with that. I, th I thought that is where journalism is gonna go because we're all walking around with this stuff. So what I did is I, I started working for them and all I would bring on set would be like, you have your, uh, you know, your cell phone with on a, like a tripod or gimbal and like a little microphone on top. And then, you know, the phones themselves have uh, the flash they can use as a light. So there's your like eye light for doing stand up interviews. I mean, it's that's the you know, that's what for me is extremely exciting about where technology is heading. Uh, but it's also because I've been constantly on the frontier of it trying to figure it out. I'm sure a lot of professionals in the industry are quaking in their boots because, you know, their their uh, jobs are going to eventually be obsolete. 
And uh, I'll say that uh, from a post-production angle, uh, you know, soon enough they're going to have uh, preset AI programs that could edit together like a rough cut for you, but just plug in your footage with your parameters. And so I can guarantee you, it might seem crazy right now, but give it five or 10 years, post-production is going to change dramatically as well. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to change the discussion to like, what are technology are you guys using in, right now, or in, any questions you have about that for, for kind of both of us. Yeah. And oh, by the way, can you uh, grab that microphone there? And I'm going to make you the microphone <laughs> and jockey here to, for everybody to pass around. It is there. I'm sorry. The people in the at home excited. is for. When you said that, because um, I, I was a news photographer in Reno, and uh, my assignment was to do a live shot with like a, a backpack. Yeah. The live view, whatever. And we didn't have reception. I was like, it's down. We can't do our live thing. She's yeah. Like, it's right. I'll just call in and do FaceTime live. Yeah. And broadcast quality live through her cell phone. I mean, that's, that is definitely where we're headed at this point. Um, yeah, I did, uh, it's funny, I was hired as an assistant photographer for a job, and they, they also wanted me to not only be assistant photographer, but then live stream face, uh, Facebook feed for them. And so I'd like log in and get the permissions. And what they didn't think through, though, is that there's like hundreds of people doing the same thing. Like people next to me were doing it uh, illegally, but um, because it was a concert. But I didn't have any reception because of it. It just crashed the whole like network. So they were all mad at me, and I'm like, by the way, I was hired to be an assistant, like taking <laughs> photographs, not. But like that's the point where you know it's becoming so commonplace now that it's funny that this company was competing against individuals who are just there live streaming, and like that's where the you know that's where we're headed for sure. Uh, but I would love to know like what are anything you guys use day in day out, or any questions or things that you might want to know more about that hopefully the two of us could be helpful with. Yeah. I just, I just like using. Oh. So we have a guy behind you first. That we'll get back to in a second. Uh, by the way, they need to talk into the mics to be heard by the stu the audience, at home, right? Audience at home, or on the web. Mm -hmm. oh. They d might not, not be at home. They could be, in the, you know, a coffee <laughs> could be shop. Out. They could be out and about, live streaming it on their phone. Uh, yeah. What's your name first? Oh, my name's Gabe. Hi, Gabe. I just want to know more about that uh, the gimbal, the handheld. Yes. Um, I think I've seen that like, also for, for DSLR. They do. Th in fact, that's where I saw it first was for DSLR cameras. They're motorized and battery powered. And so there's a sensor in it uh, f so that it'll keep it steady. And I've actually worked on my latest short film that, I'm, that you don't see in my reel because it's more of like my weird art stuff. Uh, my director of photography used that. Um, and it, I was just blown away. You know, it, it supports the weight of it, but it also is like a steady cam. I mean, I don't know if you guys are used to seeing what steady cams used to look like. Entire harnesses and counterweights <laughs> and uh, and that literally was as stable as a steady cam, uh, you know, but that you you know that you just hold in your hand. And those things I haven't actually gotten it for the cell phone, but I'm so tempted to get one now after seeing them. Yeah. So, so then my question is um, first off, like how how heavy are those things? And also like what's the what's the brand and model name? I'm not sure. If you want, like, email me afterwards. I, so those are just things I found really quickly in a Google search. I was, you know, I haven't used one personally for a cell phone, and uh, I can get you in touch with my director of photography who used uh, if on his DSLR. His is much more expensive and bigger, but those ones, I think I saw them for just a couple hundred bucks. Uh, and if you think, what is the advantage of having that? Like, literally getting a smooth, steady shot on your cell phone, that, that's the difference, again, between amateur and professional is, like, Really taking into account all those parameters that, like, of what you're going for, a steady, smooth shot. Uh, and if you're going to use that over and over again, that cost is very affordable for what you know you're going to get out of it. You want to do your, uh, you know, a nice tracking shot. Uh, you know, think about it: shooting 4K, get a wide-angle lens on your uh, cell phone that you can get a wide-angle lens attachment, and do like a, a tracking shot in. You could do like some Goodfellas or you know Sc Martin Scorsese type beautiful tracking shots with that little rig that you just had spent like three hundred dollars on. For you know, that's pretty impressive. Uh, but yeah, email me afterwards or go to my website and contact me and, uh, or just talk to me afterwards. And I, I can give you some suggestions for sure. Any, anyone else? Anybody? And also, I'd like to know what you're using. If you have something you've used, you're like, my god, I found this great. Because I'm always you know, trying to learn more. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, happy birthday to you. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm curious if, if anybody in the room knows how to use Audacity, the audio editing program. Uh, I don't personally know Audacity. You guys do? I, I, yeah, I train it. <laughs> I train people. In it. Oh, nice. 
Uh, well, I'll say I. So what I use is because um, I have the Adobe Creative Suite. I use uh, Audition, which is uh, incredibly powerful for what it for what you, what you use it for. I mean, I use do all my post workflow with it, uh, and I'll just say any of these. I'm not a you know a, a purist when it comes to any application, but I think that uh, you should definitely get familiar with them because. Uh, you know, podcasts are becoming a thing that I thought was like, is this a fad that's going to die out? And it's only intensifying. Uh, but with, you know, with the <laughs> mic we have here and, uh, you know, uh, recording directly into your computer with some, you know, uh, attachments and with that software, you can do like a professional sounding podcast with just your laptop and a microphone, uh, which I have a, f a couple of friends of mine who are, uh, they, they work at the wine bar across the street from me and they teach wine education classes. And so, uh, I just helped them create a podcast from scratch. They'd never done it before, but I kind of got them set up with the, you know, they already had the laptop. I just got them the right mics, and I produced, kind of helped them produce the first episode so they can understand the format. And now they're up and running. They're one education classes they teach live. They also have the podcast to promote it, which is another thing you have to start thinking about, which is like, you know, how do you tell a story? It comes down to the pl level playing field. How do you tell a story and the for what is important for the format? So like how they ran their classes isn't going to be perfect how they do the podcast. But they kind of nowadays, you kind of have to be everywhere. And if you notice the people that are kind of out there all the time, they're on every format, every medium. It's like, uh, who's my favorite person now? Donald Glover is like my hero right now. I don't know if you guys know him or are fans of him. But he literally, like he was a hip hop star. He's an actor. He's a writer. He's a, he does everything, and he does it well. And I think that like setting that bar that high is amazing. Like I would love it if specialization gets thrown out. It's just like how do you tell a story in what format, and you know just you know teaching yourself in some ways how to make it all happen. I, I think. To oh, yeah. the oh sorry. Uh, go ahead. Oh. Uh, um, I've, I, I guess the things I've used. I'm using. I, I I put a GoPro on the top of my regular camera. Yeah. And, and we'll just shoot wild with that. Oh, I love um, it. And and. Uh, get surprised by it because I'm usually concentrating on the close shot. And what is your normal camera you're filming on? Um, it's like a XC15 little Canon nice. 4K camera. So you have so you have like the the close up shot and the wide shot yeah, all on the same. And it, it has to be mounted on a yeah. little, uh, little extender yes. so because it's super wide and so to get it high enough not to show the camera that's it's on and stuff like that's that. That's super clever. So I might steal that from you. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 and, and you know, I just kind of set record and then ignore it and, yeah. then and then every once in a while I'm getting a perspective that actually worked better than the shot I was trying to get. For sure and I love those ha happy accidents. I mean that's the idea of like <coughs> having this technology available to you like use it, exploit it and find ways to like push it. I love that. Yeah and so my takeaway from the, uh, th the your demo is that oh. I I'd like to actually try um, staging uh, shots similar to uh, some of the um, online shots that you had in there. And I was thinking, oh, well, well, wouldn't that be cool to do a lot of your interview online mm -hmm. and, and then do an action, another interview in another place, but but intercut between the two. Yeah, exactly. So it's funny that, so one of the projects you saw in there was um, Big Dream, which is a featured documentary. And it, it's about seven young women from the, around the world achieving their dreams in technology. And uh, this is my wife who's so good at this. You know, most, uh, sit down interviews are like really over lit, right? And like, you know, polished and they're very structured. And my wife was like, well, we're talking about technology and, and it's supposed to be for younger people. They're so used to FaceTiming and video chatting and, and just using their phones. And, and so she did all of her interviews through the computer where they were like sitting down with their laptops. So they were much more open and comfortable, right? And it also it, it added that look and of, it was like I call it the veil of authenticity. It felt more real because it was like just these young women on their laptops talking. So like, not only did it make them feel more comfortable, but it, to l get them to open up quicker, but it also like for their audience, it felt like a really authentic way to communicate with them. So you know, just having the best camera and the the most you know expensive gear, like, it's not about that. It's about your storytelling ability. And that was all. I have to give my wife credit for that. She was the one who thought like, you know what, like this is how we're going to approach the sit the tr traditional sit down interview. Yeah. And I think it was really effective uh, from it. So you're just responding to the context. And like, okay, well, there's sort of ways to do this, and you can draw from those as well. But you can also kind of remix it or open up yes. this this concept and, and connect it, as you say, into these more immediate technologies that will be a benefit to the 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 uh, in this case the interview. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's something. That's why I really appreciated following your presentation. Um, 
a big part of that is like I'm always deconstructing these things and asking it like the question is why? Like why is this working? Why isn't that working? And I feel like we, even though we have very different career paths and what we've done, there is a sense of, of discovery and also of um, like I love the challenge. I, I have to admit like I so many times force myself into a corner over and over again and I have to you know, fix my way out of it. And I think that's where some of my favorite work has come from me, for me personally and the, the people and artists I follow. Like, and now that I'm a teacher, similar uh, you know, to Carl, one of the things I emphasize all the time with my students is I'm like, be fearless and be, a, uh, be ready to fail repeatedly and then try to like figure it out of why it happened and like pick yourself back up. And then, you know, th that analyzation process of like why things are working or not working is never ending. And if you're not excited about that, uh, you know, then you probably should find another career path because this, like I said, the, it's only going to get crazier. And the next, the acceleration of technology is only going to make you have to learn and adapt quicker. And I think that's what, uh, you know, the one lesson I try to instill into my students is that, like, be your own teacher, but also constantly be curious and be messing things up and failing constantly uh, because, like, that's where the, the, the happy mistakes. Like, I love that you have the GoPro on top, right? And, you know, maybe it's you're like, man, I did this whole thing and only there's only two minutes of useful stuff. Well, you know what? Those two minutes are priceless because if you didn't have it there, you wouldn't have got it. Uh, and one of the things I say all the time is that, like, I'll be asked by people, like, oh, uh, there's this event coming up and the camera I wanted to borrow is, isn't available. And I'm like, come on. Like, whatever you need to do to grab, what it, just bring whatever you got, get media. And like, especially nowadays, people are so used to mixed media of like mixed formats. I mean, uh, you watch a, a, a high production quality value television show. They're showing, you know, cell phone footage. They're showing GoPros. They're using, um, you know, Facebook feed or like social media feeds. They'll like show cut to that. I'm like, that's become it's becoming so normal, which I love. That it's like mixed media everywhere. You just grab the media from where you can get it. Uh, to the point where people actually, so funny, now the cameras are getting so good with the chip technology uh, that I, a lot of my uh, photographers I work with intentionally get really old lenses because there's imperfections in them. They're, you know, they don't design or make them anymore, partly because of there's like lead in them and stuff, but still. They, uh, no, but there's like, those are a, a look that you have to kind of degrade the image and give it some personality because just perfect pristine is not that interesting, especially to humans, you know. Uh, yeah, you have a question? Well, I, I actually, Carl, I, I worked at a rental house in San Francisco in the 80s that rented out that switcher board. Oh, uh, excellent. <laughs> oh, no <laughs> way. the beginning there, so I, I can appreciate how much fun it was to experiment with that. And I, my, my thing is that there is already so much media out there and so much historic media, mm -hmm. and it's never been more accessible at oh, any yeah. point in history. And so I, I, um, I just, I know, you know, salvaging that kind of stuff. If you, Carl, if you know of centers like that are doing the, salvaging the uh, instrumentation tools and things to do in different ways. Are there other places that are, um, that are, are archiving that and, and yeah. salvaging it? Well, I mean, Open Signal itself has like glitch workshops, which I include like, you know, <laughs> colorizers from the 80s or 90s that have been like rewired so that they become these like differently expressive tools. Um, that Signal Culture is in upstate New York and they um, have all these machines, some of which are from the 70s and 80s and others are, are more recent. And they have residencies for artists, researchers and tool makers. And they try to structure them together so you can like network and learn from uh, others. Um, yeah, uh, those are the kind of places that are sort of coming to mind. Um, but I think that's sort of an important, uh, th th these sort of like histories, um, these kind of media archeologies are, mm -hmm. are so, um, uh, can be so um, informative mm -hmm. and um, and we're going through so many different types of media and formats in such mm -hmm. a compressed period of time it's, it's unprecedented yeah there's with like with the digital right there's a, a tendency uh, generally speaking towards sort of a black box mm -hmm. device where you can't really understand how it works or, or it's, it's, it's more difficult um, to sort of articulate the process but that but to the extent that you can articulate your process, okay, well, how do I get from here to here is so valuable. Um, right. uh, my, what I tell my students is that they should always be like um, sort of blogging about, keep a research blog about their sort Smart. of experiments and, and just like really trying to articulate, well, what was I trying to do and what did I discover and what were the challenges, but sort of like map it out and then your like future self's gonna pat you on the back <laughs> like, whoa, man, this is an amazing trove. I remember that thing I did a few years ago, and you can go back to it, and it has new 
sort of value. But of course, it's also in the mix with these different technologies and softwares and things aren't backwards compatible, mm -hmm. but okay, couldn't you just get to a similar right. sort of technique by this, the, the long way and the wrong way is some way, <laughs> sometimes the best way. Right, I just had to go through th four different technologies in order to salvage some old video VHS footage. I'll ask a follow-up yeah. if I could on that. Sure. You know, at what stage in this technological evolution do you guys like let go of old gear, get rid of old right. gear, and what do you do with that old gear when you get rid of it? Well, moving uh, helps. Moving helps, well, yeah. I mean, I essentially gifted 16 millimeter film cameras to a couple Ooh. people throughout my journey, uh, an eight millimeter, and now I'm like, kind of settled for a couple years and I'm kicking myself, but I'm still friends with those people. <laughs> but honestly, I, don't, I, I would rather if I had the space for it, just hold on to everything or at least like have it around because I, I don't know if you, I was hoping there'd be more like, like super younger students because, uh, or people in the audience because I've heard that there's like a huge uh, embracing of film again where it's like, <laughs> and I like so <laughs> annoyingly like at a fr like just necessity yeah. gave up all these cameras where yeah. I'm like I would much rather have gifted them to like younger people to go around with the Super 8 cameras and, oh, and run around with them. The Super 8 camera again. Yeah, yeah, which is, I <laughs> yes, I love that. I'm so encouraged by it. The more that, you know, it's a, I love that it's a hobby. It's, a lot of that stuff should be kind of hobbyist art for like just experimentation. Uh, you know, is it going to be an industry standard? Maybe it shouldn't be. Like it's kind of better it isn't. But <laughs> uh, how about yourself? Do, or do you are you tend to hold on to? Uh, technology and gear yourself? I actually just uh, got rid of a whole bunch of family film, uh, ah, various okay. formats, still film cameras, and yeah. some high eight and super eight film yeah. cameras, uh, and I'll probably regret that soon. <laughs> well, hopefully they get a new life with yeah. some, you know, another generation comes up. Uh, right, right, right. You know, I hope they've gone to good them. homes yeah. already. Uh, but then, you know, professionally where I work, we've still got a whole lot of good old analog equipment, you know, yeah. Echo Lab MV5 switchers, two of them, uh, video distribution amps, all of it analog, some analog patch bays, time base correctors, yeah. uh, stuff like that. Well, and my, space know. is not an option. You know, we have run yeah. out of space. We got to. Well, move. I think that's what. Yeah. Hopefully, what's happening, especially with the internet, is you get groups of like you know just uh, obsessed people who collect these things and keep them going. And you know, uh, that's why. What's the name of that? place in um, upstate New York uh, in single Owego, culture. single culture, like, you know, places like Open Signal, uh, single culture, like, it, the fact that these places exist for me are great, this museum of technology, because I do think there's a huge value to it that with the push for the new technology, you tend to like, cr you know, crush over all this stuff that it has a value to it that I don't think is fully understood till way later. Uh, so yeah, I hope there people are preserving these things. But. Uh, oh, so we had other questions over here. <coughs> okay. Um, well, if you're doing audio only, since there's a question about Audacity, uh, I, I use a lot of gear. In fact, my house has been described as a partially digested and regurgitated radio shack. Um, and that's literally true as I'm going through it now. But uh, if you're working in audio only, your, your options are huge. Uh, my home studio... Uh, is entirely just sort of sewn together as needed, when needed. Um, you know, we have articulating microphone stands. We have four of them. They are IKEA lamps that we have respringed and rebolted. Uh, they are bolted to a resurfaced uh, uh, Goodwill kitchen table that we've modified to act as a as a microphone stand. Um, our soundproofing is rock wool bound up corset style inside of burlap and you know stapled to the to the wall um reuse is is and we, we've got we did a modestly syndicated commercial radio show out of that studio and uh so all the stuff that we're talking about how just how you can get amazing video uh out of out of just stuff that you've got in literally literally your pocket that also can happen with audio gear as well i mean absolutely i've i've made some really stellar material uh just I, I didn't have an, I didn't have the stuff on me, but I had my phone, so I recorded its stuff with my phone, and with just a little bit of effort, I was able to get professional, you know, was able to get really great sounding stuff out of it. Um, I may be doing that this week because I realized I left my left my backpack at home, so this is all I've got with me. But uh, yeah, that's so. a great point. In fact, I want to use that as a springboard. So I about the whole mobile thing and, and audio. So like when I was telling this, I was collaborating on this little short film project for a, for an actor friend of mine 
and she literally had a, you know, only a, an iPhone record on. And I was like, do you have any like extra iPhone for at least like to have a, you know, they come with what is it, the um, like memos and note. You can literally record audio that's really good quality. But the and w the difference bet with almost every microphone is like you just got to get it as close as you can to the mouth, like or this or where the sound is coming from, so you can eliminate all the extraneous sound. Mm. And uh, so what I was saying is, so much of your stuff is people talking on a phone back and forth. I was like, why don't you just have the memo and press record, and in the scene you're literally speaking directly mm. into a microphone, or you put it on the table because everybody always has phones out, and it was like a modern film, so that you could literally have your phone out when you're recording the scene and it's recording audio and it's right here you're almost speaking directly into it right. that's like a super lo-fi way of get doing it so you have one iPhone is recording you know 4k video and another one recording you know very high quality audio as well that's just like you're almost speaking directly into so there's like so many lo-fi ways to like you know get incredibly useful good content and footage uh, it, it's a weird yeah. thing because I think a lot of people assume that phones make phone quality audio when just as much work has gone into getting yeah. good sound out of These those are great devices microphones in here. as they have out of getting good video. And great lenses. Yeah, that's why like the mobile technology, I think it's only going to intensify. Uh, who knows where it'll end up going. But, you know, be, be okay. Feel confident in like if you show up and all you're doing is, you know, filming video on your phone, like don't feel bad. And it's soon enough, like have that little gimbal. I mean, I'm, I'm just waiting to the point where drone and mobile technology goes together where I can throw my phone in the air and it just hovers here. And I'm not kidding. Like that sounds insane, but like give it a few years and all of a sudden I have my little drone phone that just follows me around and records everything. We're get first. seriously like in like you have your little things here. You just like throw it in the air and there it is. Say, like, come, come. Yeah, and it comes exactly. from wherever you left it. So I mean, <laughs> it's just we're getting to that point now. We're just like you know, you, I don't know. It's getting ridiculous. But uh, yeah, you had a question or a comment? Anyone? So we have like five uh, minutes left. Oh, in the back. Yeah. Thank you for wrangling. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, going back to um, useful items mm -hmm. that you can repurpose for production use. Um, a few years ago at our facility, uh, we were having solar panels installed on the roof and they wanted that covered. So I was tasked with uh, doing a, a time lapse of the event. And we had uh, several GoPro cameras and DSLRs available. And one of the things I needed to do was to weatherproof the, the cameras because it was taking place in June and that particular June was very rainy. Mm -hmm. It got a lot of mix of rain and sun. Uh, typical June weather for the Portland area. And so what I came up with was taking a trip to the dollar store and finding um, uh, food containers, reusable food containers, ah, yeah. that for a dollar you get, you can get a whole assortment of different sizes of these clear food containers. Yeah. And uh, that with some clear silicone glue and uh, an X-Acto knife and a little ingenuity, I was able to build weatherproof housings for the time-lapse cameras where I could cut a hole for the lens to stick through and also have the uh, mount for the base of either the GoPro or DSLR yeah. so it could be mounted. Uh, it also allowed for power to be ran through. I was able to use the silicone glue to, to put in an, uh, an AC power adapter where I, that I could connect to an extension cord on the outside. Um, and also, uh, to counter any humidity that might build up, I would get packets of desiccant ah, okay, and put yeah. packets of desiccant in there to keep it dry. Nice. And uh, over a two-week period, I was able to capture amazing footage. Yeah. Um, um, how did you, if you were powering the GoPros, those are known for just the battery dies, though. They, they, they would. Swapping them out and bring, putting them yeah. back in? Or, okay. And so I had to power them externally. Okay. So good. I was running power to the GoPros. Uh, also, I found that we were using the GoPro Hero 4s, which had a tendency to overheat and fail after yeah. about 30 minutes. So I also had to find a way to keep those cool, cool. <laughs> And while in this, in this weatherproof housing. And the resolution I found is we had, a, um, we had a bad HDMI cable. There's a very thick cable. And so I, I got an HDMI, a micro HDMI connector for it, plugged it into the side of the camera and did not use it for any kind of monitoring or anything. I used it as a heat sink oh, nice. to yeah. draw the, that long HDMI cable. It was like a 50 foot cable made a really good heat sink that I kept in the shade. That's and um, it, it kept, was able to keep the camera cool uh, while at the same time getting time lapse. And all I had to do yeah. was some math to figure how, at how many frames per second or how many yeah. seconds per frame 
uh, of an interval between um, the start date and the stop date that I needed to be able to have continuous coverage. Yeah, I mean, I love that, you know, there's always a solution out there. And I, one of the most interesting ones I saw, and I was, I was years ago, I was filming at X Games, and I saw this guy <coughs> who was, he had this little egg timer and, and a GoPro t attached to it, like super glued to it. So he was getting these um, time lapse shots that were like wrap around 360 time lapse shots right. because it was he would you know do the math on the frame rate but then also um, like you know it would be this like a completely steady wrap around because it was on, on an egg timer that cost him what three to five dollars to create that whole rig <laughs> exactly. and uh, you can like buy off the shelf technology that's like way more expensive that'll do that sure remote controlled and you can program in different settings but talk about just like I want to get this shot how do I hack something together to make it happen I think that's you know, I, one of the things I did is with my, uh, I wanted to get a really smooth tracking shot of a vineyard of going in. So uh, I ratchet strapped my camera to the top of the car and just like, I, I let, you know, put it in first, you know, first gear and just kind of like smoothly, you know, do a track in. Like that's as easy sometimes as you need. Like there's always a solution out there. It's just like, what do you have on hand? And at the time I had the ratchet straps because I was, uh, carting stuff, you know, on, you know, putting on all my gear on carts and bringing it around. So it was as simple as, oh, I can take the tripod head off, put it on the top, ratchet strap that down, and it's good for one little smooth shot. You know, those are like like the, the dolly. I love the shopping cart dolly. dolly. It's that or the wheelchair dolly is like every film school student's, uh, you know, their epiphany or skateboard or... Uh, you do, but it's also why, you know, the, if you don't have access to the... It's funny because I, so many, especially when I was younger, I, I was guilty of this. You're like, oh, I need to have this piece of technology or gear to get the shot. Like, I need to have this. I need to, And then you just, out of necessity, because you're broken, you know, young filmmaker, you just find a way to, to, to you know, figure it out. And that, I like, I've tried to always have that in the back of my head no matter what, you know, level of production I'm on, whether it's a super, you know, funded, high-quality thing, or, like, just me and myself. I try to always have that, like, how do I problem-solve this in the back of my head? All right, so how we do... Oh, I think we're pretty much done. Uh, any last minute uh, things? We have like a minute. You can also no? talk informally outside of the. Oh yeah, I. Context. We can also. T we probably should. We probably should wrap it up. Well, thank you so much, everyone, and happy birthday, Carl. Yeah.